All right, so welcome to the technical demo of API Fortress. And so the first thing I want to mention is that API Fortress is a platform in the sense that every user that has a login uh, that can access the platform sees the same thing, sees all the tests, sees all the dashboards. And so uh, everyone can collaborate. It makes it really easy for all of the team members to collaborate uh, and specifically to allow you to bridge that gap between your developers and your QAs when you're working on API testing. Uh, and then the other benefit really is that all of the data lives in a single place. Um, so it's, you know, it's easily findable, easily shareable, all of those things. So with that being said, let's jump right in. So this is the main screen of API Fortress. Each one of these little boxes is a project. A project can contain many tests within them. And so projects are important because the grouping here is that tests that are related to a specific API, specific microservice, or APIs that connect to each other should all kind of be grouped together into a single project. And mainly because the dashboards where the data is aggregated is very project-based. And then also when you get into the automation, uh, like CICD, uh, this is also very project-based. So first thing is let's write a test in API Fortress. So there are uh, a few different ways to write a test in API Fortress. You can write a test completely from scratch, or you can use the automated test generation feature. And really there are a couple ways of doing this. Uh, one of them being importing of a spec file. So this is where you can import any sort of Swagger 2.0, RAML files, OpenAPI 3 files, SOAPWSDL, Postman collections, any of those things can be imported and then a test generated from there. But the way I'd like to show you now is kind of the, the main way of doing it, which is just directly from an API call. And so here I have a blank test and an HTTP client at the bottom here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make an API call. So, and we'll give it a key header. So if I hit send here, you can see the JSON response that comes back. So from here, generating a test is really easy. All you do is you click generate test and the platform does three things for you. It generates an input data. It actually creates the HTTP request and then it creates all of the assertions. So if you do all three, you get the all set and the platform will auto generate this schema validation type test for you. And so really what's happening here is the platform looked at the request that we made any request details that went out, like the headers, if it was a post call, then the post body as well. And then it looks at the response that came back, including the headers, the body, the status code, all of that. And it generated this test for us. And so really what the platform does is, the first thing it does is it puts the API call right at the top. So you can see the, the get call here and it automatically parameterizes it for you. So protocol, domain, endpoint, even the key value gets parameterized. The reason the platform does this uh, is mainly because we want the test to be very reusable so that you don't have four different tests for the same API just because it's in four different environments, right? QA, staging, development, production. The idea is to have a single test that can be run in multiple environments to allow you to have less maintenance costs, to have less tests to maintain, less tests to schedule, all of that. And so what you can actually do is using the environment section, create runtime overrides for the values. And then when you choose an environment and run the test, it actually replaces all the variables and runs it, makes it really easy. And then what the platform will do is based on what it saw, it'll create assertions. So it'll say, okay, so I noticed that the API that you made, I made a call to returned a status code of 200. So I'm gonna validate that it returns 200. I also noticed the content type header was application JSON, so I will validate that as well. And then I noticed that the actual response was an array. And so I'm gonna validate that it returns an array, and then I'm gonna loop through the array and validate each item uh, element within there. And so category element exists, the color element is actually returning an array as well, so I'll validate that. Uh, 
ID element is returning an integer. So I'll validate that it returns an integer every time and not uh, a string or something. The image URL element is returning a URL that's not broken, that doesn't have any special characters or anything weird in it. Prices of a float type, uh, quantity integer, updated at exists, all of that. And so the auto-generated test kind of takes care of a lot of that initial lifting for you. Right? You don't have to write the schema validation type tests. Your functional, functional test is essentially taken care of. And then you, know, you can focus your energies and efforts on creating more complex tests, business logic tests, integration and end tests, uh, all these sorts of tests that you should be testing for um, with API specifically. So with this, let's go ahead and run this test and see what happens. So if I click run, the first thing you'll notice is that there are these things called downloaders. Now, downloaders are tiny applications that are deployed on a server somewhere that are actually making the API call for you. And so uh, in the SaaS platform, which is what we're looking at now, you get five of these out of the box, US East, US West, Europe West, South America, and then another one in US East with SSL validation disabled. These are actually located in servers uh, in AWS in these servers in this location. So EU West is in Dublin, Ireland. South America is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, US East is in, in Ashburn, Virginia, I believe. And so if we pick any of these and run the test, what happens is we get a test report. Now, every single time a test is executed in the platform, whether it be manually like I just did, or um, automated via the schedule or CSED, one of these test reports is always generated, uh, and then you can find them stored in the platform and go back and view them. And so what a test report gives you is, first, you just get some test details, like the fact that it passed, the name of the test, when it ran, Dublin, Ireland, because we chose EU West as the uh, downloader. Then you get a high level of how many assertion failures or HTTP failures there were. Then you get a full uh, printout of the test itself. So we can see the get call that we made. And if we click see more, you can actually see the request details as well as the full API response. Then you can see all of the assertions being validated, status code equals 200, content type headers, application JSON, this root payload, that's where it's actually gonna loop through the array of the response and validate everything. So category exists, colors of an array type, IDs, long value, and loop through so on. So category, color, ID, category, color, ID, all the way until it validates the entire API response. Now, this test passed. If there were any failures in the assertion, a see more tab would pop up and done. They would also be highlighted in red and you'd get some failure details right here. But a see more tab would pop up and what this would allow you to do is get detail on the failure, but also get a snapshot of the API response at the point of failure. This makes it really easy to debug. You don't have to go back and forth. Everything is in a single screen uh, and then you can find the issue, fix it and move on. Uh, the one thing I, I didn't mention with the downloaders is in the SaaS platform, you get these out of the box. They're located uh, on AWS in the on-premises deployment, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit more later. But the on-premises is where we give you a container. You deploy it completely in your infrastructure behind your firewalls. And this is a great uh, alternative for when you have APIs that are locked down behind firewalls that are only accessible by VPN tunnels, things like that. And so what this allows you to do is deploy these downloaders in those servers behind your firewalls, and then you can access all of those APIs without doing any whitelisting or, or opening up any tunnels or anything like that. So we created a test, we ran a test, uh, now what? So one of the biggest things that you can do in the platform in terms of automation is scheduling it directly from the platform. So if I publish this test, which really just means that there are two copies of the test, a working copy and a published copy. This gives you the ability to have a scheduler or an automation through CICD running a, work, a published copy of the test and then make some edits and play around with it without messing up the scheduler. And then you can publish the changes when you're confident. And so now that the scheduler button's available, if I click on it, 
I can create a new scheduled run. And so what you can do is give it a name and then you choose a downloader. The cool thing here is you can choose multiple. So in, I think the big, one of the biggest use cases is production monitoring. What this allows you to do is monitor your API from all the locations that your end user might be uh, using the API from, right? So not only for testing purposes, can you test that the API is reacting as it should from specific locations where your end users might be, but also for monitoring purposes, you can schedule it to run multiple times from different servers that allow you to kind of get the best idea of how your API or functionality is behaving on a schedule. And so what I mean by on a schedule is on a frequency basis. So how frequently do you want this test to run? Every 10 minutes? Cool. So now this test will run every 10 minutes of every hour of every day of every month. And yeah, you can choose which day or of the month or which month for more granularity. But once you have this and you save it, this test will now run every 10 minutes from two different locations. Uh, and so it'll run twice every 10 minutes. And you know the platform will automatically kick that off and the results will get saved. And where you can view those results is in the dashboard. So the dashboard gives you all of the data. Again, it is project specific, so you can choose between which projects. So you get a logs view that shows you all of the tests that you've executed, when they ran, how many warnings and failures there were, where you ran it from, status, all of that. You can go into any old test and find that test report, view the details of that test report. Uh, and then the second thing you can do is look at the metrics. And so the metrics gives you all of the APIs that have been called during your tests, uh, latency and fetch time, status response code, all of that. You can filter the dashboards by date range. Uh, you can say past week, or you can choose a specific date range. You can filter by which endpoints or which tests in the logs view, locations that they ran from, all of that. Everything is filterable completely. The really the the good thing here, I think, is that all of your data is aggregated in one location. It gives you the ability to kind of go in really quickly and see how your tests have been behaving. You get kind of a chart of the successes and failures of all of your tests. And so it makes it really easy to have a single point where you can find all of your data and get a quick glance of, is your API functioning properly? Is there any failures that you should be looking at debugging? Uh, and so this, in a monitoring sense, this allows you to do two things. And so the first thing is you can monitor your production APIs, uh, which allows you to catch bugs faster, right? So when, when your API is in production, if you're only testing them once in a while manually, you're allowing chances for bugs to be, to live there for a while. So if you're monitoring them constantly, the minute an error happens, you'll know, you can find the bug and fix it and, and move on. And so that's, I think, one of the biggest uh, value propositions for, for the scheduler. And the other one is, uh, you know, everyone thinks of monitoring their production APIs, right? You want to be able to catch bugs faster in production. The, I think the other important aspect is actually monitoring your other environments, like your dev, your QA, your staging environments. And so what you can do is you have these tests that are running in those environments, and you run them as a monitor, run it every 10 minutes, every 30 minutes, every hour, whatever it is. And this gives you the ability to catch bugs earlier in the cycle so that you're not even pushing bugs into production, right? You're catching them in the development and QA environments and staging environments before they're even pushed to production. There are two features that are not available on the SaaS and are only available on the on-premises deployment, which is, again, where we give you a container, you deploy it on your own environment, uh, and you go from there. These two features are mocking and load testing. And so let's jump into those and look at what those features can do for you. So the first thing I wanna show you is mocking. Mocking it allows you to create an API endpoint within the platform to use uh, for a couple really uh, different reasons. So I think the first one is, or the first one and the biggest one is, allows you to shift left by mocking your APIs that are still in development and write these tests earlier, right? So you have an API still being developed, but you know how it's gonna work. You can recreate that 
API in the platform and then write tests around it. And now when your API is ready, you just have to replace the URL and you have a bunch of tests written and ready to go. So you're testing even before your API is fully ready, which is great. Uh, and then the other, the other useful case is to replace dependencies. So if you do have a flow where one of the APIs in the middle is a third-party API that you have no control over, you could mock it up here, replace it, uh, and you know, kind of get gain some control that way. And so way, the way this works is you create uh, a path, and then you can create a bunch of endpoints within it. And so once you have that defined, you create the responses that this API will give. So in this case, I actually have a wildcard at the back end of my API. So I'm saying that last slash, anything after that can be lowercase, uppercase, or a number, or any combination of. And then when I define my response, I can use this expression field to evaluate any of the inputs uh, that are coming in to determine the output. So in this case, I'm saying th if whatever's in this wildcard here, if it equals one, two, three, then I should respond with this response here if it's a get method. If it's a post method and the post body has a uh, object called ID with the value of four, five, six, then I should actually respond this way. You can do things like have dynamic mocks. Uh, and so I can say like, whenever I call this uh, endpoint with a get method, either rep reply or respond uh, complete or incomplete based on the current time in milliseconds and if it's divisible by two or not. And so the mocks are very powerful. Uh, you can do quite a lot with it. The mocks also have this sort of um, key value storage system that allows you to even do things like every time I call it, increment some ID by one. So I can call this uh, API. The first time I call it, I get the ID element is one. The next time I call it, it returns two, and the next time three, and so on. Uh, so it's, it's quite powerful. It's quite dynamic, uh, and you can do a lot with it. The, the other feature is load testing. And so load testing is um, a little different in the API Fortress platform than typical API load testing. So typical API load testing is you take an API, and you just ping it 10,000 times in a couple minutes just to see if your API slows down, if it crashes, if it becomes unresponsive. Um, this is useful, don't get me wrong. Uh, you can definitely do this, and this is a good thing to know. But the way we like to look at load testing and performance testing is really taking your full functional tests or your integration tests or your flow tests and running them at load. And really, I think this is useful because what this lets you do is it get it lets you get a sense of how your APIs work or your flows work in real life situations, right? You might have a ton of users hitting your, your front end or your UI, which is actually calling your APIs at a time. And so testing that flow of logging in, adding to cart, checking out, logging out at load gives you, a, I think, a much better sense of how your APIs function. And so what you can do in the platform is actually take any functional test or integration test that you've written by going into a project and then picking the test and run it at load. And what I mean is a couple of things. So the first thing is you choose the duration. So I'm, I'll say five minutes and then a ramp up time of 30 seconds. And so what this means is for 30 seconds before the test starts, your functional test, your integration test gets run a couple of times. This allows everything to come up to max operating capacity like the platform itself, the servers, uh, services that are hosting your API, your APIs, everything can, can wake up and be at full operating capacity. And then for five minutes, your API will get run or your test will get run at max capacity, max load. And what I mean by that is based on these load agents. And so load agents are very similar to downloaders in the sense that they are tiny applications that are deployed somewhere. The difference here is that load agents actually have virtual users assigned to them. And so if I select one of these, I can choose any number from one to 10. And so if I put five here, what that means is this functional or integration test can be run five times in parallel at a given moment. And so for five minutes, there are five virtual users running your test and each time a test execution finishes, it just starts running it again and again until the time is up. If I do 10, that means 10 virtual users and 10 parallel executions of your test. And so this number is just the number that I have. Um, these are fully configurable. So because it is on-premises, it really depends on how large your servers are, right? 
you have a massive, massive server with a lot of uh, CPU cores and, and a ton of RAM, go ahead, deploy a load agent with 10,000 virtual users, 100,000 virtual users. Um, you know, we really don't limit you in any way. And so you re can really get a good sense of how your API test is behaving in a real life scenario. You can even deploy multiple load agents and disperse the load across them to get a sense of, okay, how's my flow working if I have users in multiple uh, geographics that are, are using it at load, it's all of that. Uh, I won't run the test uh, for the purposes of not staring at it for five minutes, but we can take a look at one I've already executed before. And so if I click on it, I get some uh, little information, but if I click into the report document, very similar to the report document that we get on the functional testing side, uh, you get every load test gets a report document as well. And so again, at the top, you just get metadata, like name of the, the task, how long it ran for, how many users, all of that. But then you get two things. You get a performance view or a performance metrics, which tells you how many times your API was called within the test and how many times was that API call successful. You get your fetch and latency times over the testing period broken down, uh, in this case, by minute mark. If it was a really long test, maybe by five minute mark. Uh, and then your peak response time, again, broken down in increments. So this gives you an idea of how your metrics are uh, working for your APIs at load. You also get a breakdown of how many successful and failed calls there were to the API during the test. And then for each API endpoint called in your test, you get a list of all the status codes that are responded with and how many of each, as well as an average and peak latency, fetch, and overall times for that API call. Then at the bottom here, you get an event summary. This is how many times your full functional test was executed. Uh, and so in this case, I actually only have one API call in my test. That's why that number matches. If there were two API calls, this number would be 90,000 uh, and this one would be 45. And so for the events, you get how many times your full functional test was executed, how many times did it succeed or did it fail? And then again, a breakdown of successes and failures by increments. And so in this case, everything passed. Uh, there are no failures. If there was a failure, you would just say, it would just tell you that a failure occurred. You don't get any details on the failure. And this is because this is a low test uh, report. And so this report could become massive if there were details on failures. And so what we do instead is we offer this C failure section. And what this does is it gives you a list of all the failures that occurred during that load test details on the failure, and then allows you to debug in from there. And so there you have it. Uh, that is the entire API Fortress platform, uh, both the SaaS version, as well as the additional features you gain on the on-premises. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.